Welcome to my new YouTube channel Rad Vision. I will be presenting cases, concepts, spotters, rapid read sessions in my new YouTube channel. So welcome to the case of the month. I'm Dr. S. Navin Kumar, Professor of Radio Diagnosis, Chilvada Anandarav Institute of Medical Sciences, Chief Radiologist and Director, Mahalakshmi MR and Diagnostics, Private Limited, Karinagar. Coming to the history, a 40-year female came with complaints of headache, progressive weakness of right upper and lower limb since two months. Initial MRI reported as amyloid angiopathy bleed two months back. But still the headache and vomitings have increased, fresh episodes of seizures and progressive increase of weakness in right upper and lower limb even after treatment. So they came for MRI second opinion. So these are the T1 actual weighted images. You can see lobulated heterogeneously hyperintense signal lesion noted in left frontal lobe partly extending into left capsular ganglionic region with significant mass effect and midline shift. So this is the central ISO2 hyperintense component. These are the septations and these are the fluid fluid levels of variable signal. These are the T2 actual weighted images. You can see this is the central ISO2 hyperintense component. These are the septations. These are the fluid levels of variable signal. And even there is significant perilational edema. These are the actual flare weight flare images. You can see these are the septations, fluid levels, and the central ISO2 hyperintense component. There is significant edema noted at center of the lesion. The edema is also seen crossing the midline onto right side and even extending into the contralateral cerebral hemisphere. These are the actual diffusion weighted images. You can see there is restricted diffusion in the central ISO2 hyperintense component. There is no restriction in the periphery of the lesion. Coming to the GRE actual images, you can see there is blooming noted in the septa. There is blooming also noted in the fluid levels. There is also peripheral rim of blooming on GRE around the lesion. Coming to the T1 actual weighted images, post contrast, you can see patchy heterogeneous enhancement in the central ISO2 hyperintense component and enhancement noted in few septa. For comparison, these are the T1 axial pre-contrast, T1 axial post-contrast. You can see there is patchy heterogeneous enhancement in the central ISO2 hyperintense solid component and even enhancement along few septa. These are the cranial sections. You can see there is patchy heterogeneous enhancement. In the coronal T1 weighted images, you can see the lesion is seen crossing the midline onto right side. Along the carpus callosum, there is significant mass effect and midline shift. So these are the all the sequences in one image. You can see this is the ISO2 hyperintense central hyperintense area, which is hyperintense on T1, hyperintense on T2, hyperintense on flare, showing restricted diffusion on DWA, faint areas of blooming on GRE, and showing patchy heterogeneous enhancement. So these are the findings we have already discussed. So coming to the differentials you can consider in this case are acute intracerebral hematoma or hypertensive bleed, amyloid angiopathy bleed or cerebral amyloidoma, bleed due to underlying vascular malformation, bleed secondary to aneurysmal rupture, venous hemorrhage due to cerebral venous and thrombosis, tumoral bleed or primary hemorrhagic neoplasm or hemorrhagic metastasis. These are commonly considered differentials in case of a low bar bleed. So I will show few cases which will be supporting these differentials. So history of headache and scissors, you can see ISO2 hyperintense area in the left frontal lobe, hyperintense on T2, showing blooming on GRE with perlation edema. This is the normal benign bleed or low bar bleed. Coming to the, we can compare this lesion with the present case. You can see this is lobulated, irregular in shape, septar seen, solid component is seen and variable signal due to fluid fluid levels, septa and solid component. There is significant perilational edema surrounding the lesion and the edema is also seen crossing the midline onto contralateral cerebral hemisphere. But in case of a benign bleeds or low bar bleeds, you can see edema only confined to the lesion. History of chronic hypertension, vomitings and imbalance while walking. You can see this in this case there is a bleed in the right cerebellum. There are multiple punctate microbleeds in the brainstem, cerebellum, even in the capsular region, and few lobar bleeds. 
So this is a case of a hypertensive bleed and multiple microbleeds due to hypertension. This is a case where we can say history of severe headache, recurrent seizures and loss of consciousness. You can see multiple abnormal niche of blood vessels in the left frontal lobe. There are multiple serpiginous flow voids adjacent to the lesion. There is a few large feeding artery probably arising from the left MCA. And there is blooming on GRE noted within the lesion. Blooming also noted in lateral ventricles. So this bleed is likely due to AVM with bleed, lobar bleed and even intraventricular hemorrhage. This is the case history of unconsciousness, headache, vomitings and blurring of vision. You can see a bleed in the right temporal lobe, partly extended to the parietal lobe. There is blooming in the superior vermian system and even in the lateral ventricles. There is subtle blooming in the sulci in bilateral parietal lobes. In angio, you can see there is a small outpouching like lesion arising from P2 segment of right PCA, which is correlating with the bleed area. So likely this is a bleed likely due to rupture of aneurysm from the P2 segment of right PCA with even SAH and IVH. So this is a common case we encounter in regular practice, issue of chronic headache and vomitings. You can see hyper intense area in the left temporoparietal lobe showing blooming on GRE and there is hyper intense signal in the left transverse and sigmoid sinus. So this is a case of venous hemorrhage due to cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. This other case is of primary carcinoma of thyroid with the weakness of right upper and lower limb. You can see blooming area in the left cerebellum, left frontal lobe, left frontal parietal lobes with significant perilational vasogenic edema. And these lesions are showing nodular enhancement, ring like enhancement, target pattern of enhancement. And you can see multiple tiny nodular enhancing lesions in bilateral cerebral parenchyma. Considering the history, these are definitely metastasis and likely hemorrhagic metastasis. So coming to our case, so I suspected a case of neoplastic lesion with hemorrhage or cystic degenerative necrosis. The points in favor of diagnosis of a neoplastic lesion. So how to differentiate a tumoral bleed from a normal bleed? So points in favor of a neoplastic lesion with hemorrhage are the progression of symptoms even after treatment or follow up, no decrease in the size of the lesion even after two months, non-resolving edema or mass effect at center of the lesion even after two months and even after treatment. There are no associated microbleeds in the cerebral parenchyma as we have seen in the case. No abnormal flow voids or feeding vessels in or at center of the lesion to support it as a vascular malformation or bleed due to vascular malformation and variable shape signal intensity with septations, solid component, fluid fluid levels and variable enhancement. This is the clinching factor which will give us a clue of a tumoral bleed when compared with the normal bleed. Normal bleed will not have septations, solid components, fluid fluid levels of variable signal intensity and will not show a variable enhancement pattern. So coming to different hemorrhagic intracranial tumors, these are the primary tumors with hemorrhage and these are the secondaries. So when you have a primary in these areas, we can expect hemorrhagic metastasis in the brain. Coming to the site, we can discuss in the following headings that is site, intratumoral hemorrhage, mostly low bar. Benign hemorrhage can be in the basal ganglia pons and cerebellum in hypertension. Low bar bleeds in case of amyloid angiopathy, venous infarcts, venous malformation, subarachnoid hemorrhage, mostly extractual. Size will be same in acute and chronic stages in intratumoral hemorrhage. Benign hemorrhage, reduction in size due to resolution of edema in chronic stages. Shape, irregular in shape in intratumoral hemorrhage, mostly regular in shape in benign hemorrhage. Solid component usually present in intratumoral hemorrhage, absent in benign hemorrhage. Septations are usually present in intratumoral hemorrhage, absent in lobar bleeds, but sometimes can be seen in convexity bleeds, especially in subacute and chronic stages. Signal of the bleed is heterogeneous or variable signal due to fluid debris level, fluid fluid levels, septations, and even solid non-hemorrhagic tumoral component. Benign bleed mostly follows a signal pattern, that is hyperacute, acute, late subacute, or chronic stages of hemorrhage. It follows it follows a signal pattern according to the age or stage of the hemorrhage in benign bleeds. Po signal post contrast, there is irregular or nodular enhancement or irregular ring enhancement in case of intratumoral bleeds, but there will be a thin rim of peripheral enhancement in benign bleeds, mostly in subacute stages. Surroundings, there is persistent perilational edema and non-resolving edema in case of intratumoral hemorrhage. 
In benign breeds, the mass effect and midline shift will be in acute and subacute stages, but there will be near total or complete resolution of the mass effect and edema in chronic stages. So the seven S I want you to remember are sight, size that is lobular, irregular in size and shape. Size there is no, no decrease in the size of the lesion even after follow up or in treatment. Signal there is pre contrast or post contrast, there is variable signal or heterogeneous signal. Solid component usually present in tumoral bleeds, septations usually present in tumoral bleeds, and surroundings that is perilesional edema which is not subsiding even after treatment and even in follow up. Follow -up. These are the seven S I want to, you to remember which will clinch or give us a clue in case of diagnosing tumoral bleeds and differentiating them from the benign or low bar bleeds. And other is time and treatment. So always try to follow up the case. So if there is no decrease in the size of the lesion and non-resolving edema even after follow up and even after treatment of the case then definitely suspect neoplastic lesion with hemorrhage than a benign bleed. So the patient was operated and hemorrhagic tissue or lesion is removed and sent for HPE. HPE came as malignant neoplasm, primary or secondary with hemorrhagic infarction and reactive glasses and they have suggested immunohistochemistry for further evaluation. These are the few references I have taken. Thank you.